I'm Zach Parks with Wired Customs and welcome to my garage. Right here in this stall, we're going to rebuild rear axles, transmissions, engines, steering components, suspension components. We're going to do leading, body work, welding, rust repair. Whatever you can do to a car, you name it, we're going to do it right here in this little garage. If I can do it in this garage, you can do it in yours. In this garage, I only have one rule. Nothing newer than 1975. start off with this 1947 Ford Coupe right here. Um, it is Jerry and Karen's car. It is new to them and they want someone who is an early Ford mechanic to look it over front to back. The car is basically stock. It's been restored I'd probably say within a 10 year time frame. Um, the paint is actually in really good condition. Overall the car is in really good condition. The interior is very close to being perfect and they just need someone who's familiar with these early Fords. Early Fords they are technically different than even 60s and 70s type cars, the way you shift them, the way you drive them. And this one is still running the flathead and three on the tree, um, which in my world is super common because I specialize in early forwards, flatheads, and these early transmissions. But overall, um, they're quite different than the later vehicles. You work on them different, they operate a little bit differently. So we're going to get into the nitty gritty. We're going to inspect this car uh, front to back. We're going to go with everything. This process could be overwhelming to you when you get your new car or new to you hot rod. In this episode, we're going to break down what you should be looking for when you get something like this that's probably been restored more than once. We're going to be breaking this down in a couple different categories. We're going to do safety. We're going to do reliability. Then we're going to do comforts. Okay? So safety is steering brakes, make sure all the suspension is nice and tight. Um, if they got to slam on the brakes somewhere, the car's not going to pull them off the road and it's actually going to stop. Now, after safety, we're going to go right into reliability. That means engine's going to be running perfectly. It's going to start up every single time. It's going to be charging well. Um, we're going to also make sure that it's shifting really well. Um, no issues downshifting. So we're going to take it on a test drive and see how safe it is, see how reliable it is and see if we can find anything else while driving it. After that, we're going to move into comforts. Uh, we're going to make sure all of these windows work really well, that it seals up so no rain comes in. We're going to make sure all of these hinges, everything's working on the car. And this is going to be a really nice blueprint for you when you get one of these old classic cars of what you should do. Go over it front to back and make sure everything is going to be safe, reliable, and comfortable. So let's get started. We're going to see what's going on with Jerry's car. He's having issues with driving it and shifting it and all sorts of stuff. So. Now, for a lot of people who are new to these early Fords, learning how to shift it and clutch it is actually different from a modern car or a normal stick shift. So, I'm going to make sure first that it's in good shape. If it is, then we got to teach them how to drive. Um, and I don't mean that in a bad way, this is, they are different than a modern car. Now, he was super worried about how his transmission has been shifting. So that's definitely what I'm going to be looking into right now.
feels like we have issues with the steering right off the bat. It, it's going to pull right really bad, so we need to look into that. The engine's warmed up, but it's acting like it's not. So we might have to adjust the choke. I don't want to drive it very far. It's not driving very good right now. Feels good. I'm not getting any advance out of the motor. It's stumbling pretty bad, so we'll start messing with the points, the carburetor, get it running right. And I need to see what's loose in the steering. I don't want to drive it too much and have an issue. Because this is a beautiful car, really, it's in good shape. It just needs some tune-up, some adjustment, that kind of stuff. So we'll get it straight. Double clutch it down in the first. I actually really love driving these column ships. So fun to ship. Okay, so the test drive wasn't as optimistic as I was hoping it was going to be. Um, we got a lot of play in the steering wheel. It wants to pull the car really hard to the right. And uh, brakes feel good, so that's optimistic. But the engine is cutting out at higher RPM. Um, so we're going to definitely look into that. Um, got to be able to get up to speed for it to be considered safe. If you're slow on the road, you're unsafe. This car goes a lot faster than 45, or should be going a lot faster than 45. And it is not. It, we're probably going 35, but I'm not sure because the speedometer doesn't work. I have no temp gauges, so I didn't know if the engine was overheating while I was driving it, so I don't want to drive it very far. So this is a beautiful car, but it's just a little bit off par, but we're going to get it there. Next, we need to move the steering wheel around because I felt a little bit of play when I was fighting not having power steering and there's a lot of play at the top of the column. So this is actually moving up and down quite a bit. That's telling me that that bushing on the top of this shaft needs to be pulled out and replaced with a good bushing. Now, when I was driving it, this um, horn was kind of flopping around when I was turning the steering wheel. So we're gonna take the horn off and see what's underneath it, see if it's actually right and it's not honking anything when we're moving this around. So let's look into that. Now to get this horn ring off on these early Fords, what I'm going to do is push down pretty hard. I'm going to put my knee up on the steering so it doesn't spin on me. Push down, spin it clockwise. It's going to unhook and come off. Should come off right there. I got a little bit fighting me. Oh, okay. So this horn piece is disconnecting from the piece underneath. That's what you get when something's this old. There we go. These two pieces are spinning on themselves, giving me a little bit of play. <laughs> and there's quite a bit of parts missing here, so there's no spring, and the little button piece is not here at all. So there should be a wire that comes all the way up through the column and have a little button right here so we're missing quite a few parts looks like this just needs to be tightened down because it's moving around too much on me I couldn't get it off at first and quite a other, quite another bit of parts missing underneath it so there's a lot going on with the steering I'm probably gonna think the whole box needs to come out cheap hinges too, they're not original. Look how that hood sits down, that's terrible. And you gotta come back here and push the hood down to get the rest of the way down. Yeah, that's not right. 
I wouldn't consider that safety, but it's not okay. Mental note for later. That's really going to annoy me. So this is the horn relay. That is actually not connected to anything. And this car has been converted over to 12 volts. So I'm going to guess that it's been converted to 12 volts. They cut the wires here so they didn't burn up this relay and uh, just never replaced it. So horn is one of the easiest things to wire up. So that'll be an easy safety fix. Now, if you don't have one at home to turn the steering wheel for you so you can check for looseness in the steering linkage, what you can do is check this wheel back and forth, try to crawl underneath it, and you can look from the bottom of what could possibly be loose. So just pushing this back and forth, left to right, I'm feeling quite a bit of looseness right here. I need to see where that is at in the system. And it looks like all the looseness is in the steering box. Um, all the linkages on the steering looks really good. So I'm going to determine that the whole steering box needs to be rebuilt. Now I'm going to check for wheel bearing play. Now if you have like a tie rod or a bad gearbox like we do in this, this circumstance, when you move it side to side, you'll be filling the gearbox. You won't feel as much of uh, the wheel bearing. So to get the wheel bearing, I'm going to move it up and down which a little tiny bit of play is normal. And what I'm feeling in this is a little tiny bit, which is normal. Um, but let's go ahead and take this off so we can inspect the brakes. So now we're going to pull the hub off so we can inspect the brakes. You can usually do it with a pry bar or a little chisel just to crack that open right there. And it shouldn't take much. These bearing nuts should not be on very tight. We're going to have a little lock washer that should not spin. It should be in a groove right here. That keeps our nut from loosening. God forbid the cotter pin falls off. Now we can pull the whole hub off. You could drop this bearing by accident, so I like to pull the bearing out first and not set it on the dirty ground. So you might end up reusing those. Now our hub should come off. If your car's been sitting for a long time, it's gonna be a lot harder than that. Okay, now what I wanna do is just check for the brake lining which the brake lining looks good. Let me pull the light around here. I don't see any wetness up here in the slave cylinder. Uh, it's all dry. It's not leaking. Nothing's pushed out. These actually look really nice. The rubber's on it. Um, our linings are a good depth. I'd say he's got a, another year or two depending on how much he drives it. Our tabs need a, some grease on them. So I'm going to pull the shoe back a little bit and put some grease on it but everything looks good and just because I like Jerry and Karen I'm gonna wipe this down put fresh grease on it throw it back together and we'll move to the other side okay now I'm gonna show you how to remove uh, rear drums on these early Fords they're not as easy as just about anything else so what we really actually have to do is pull this cotter pin out take the whole bolt off and we actually have to get a puller to pull this hub off so let's get started Cotter pin. Now you can use a wrench, you can use a ratchet, whatever works for you. I like something a little bit faster. There it is. And 
<laughs> no way. Not coming off that way. Luckily for me, I have the special tool. So let's put the special tool on and I'll show you how to pull this off. So here's our little puller right here. This is what it looks like. And it's gonna grab around the rings of the hub and it's gonna pull the hub off. So supposedly this puller is labeled to do 1930 through 1953, I think. And it's the smaller axles, it's not for the big trucks. So make sure if you're if you're looking at this video to get your own, make sure you get the right puller. Our bar in here is to keep it from spinning. all it takes if it's a fresh one that's all it takes now if you have an old car that's been sitting it's going to take a lot more than that you're gonna to have to heat up the hub around here get it nice and warm not red hot but really warm and you're gonna tap the sides of the puller and you're just jarring it you're trying to jar it loose you're not beating anything loose so it's nice when they come off this easy there we go I'm going to go ahead and take my tool off since I don't need it anymore. And that's how you get the drums off of an early Ford. And the same thing, we're going to check for pitting on our bearing surface up here which looks really good. Then the shoes look like they're in good shape. Really all we're looking at is cleaning, new grease, put it back on. So let's get to work on that. Okay, so now that we know that the shoes, the hubs, um, the slave cylinders all look good and the wheel bearings look good, now it's time to crawl underneath the car and what we're going to check for and see if there's any brake fluid leaking off any of the rubber hoses, see if the rubber hoses are cracked, dry rotted. Um, we're also going to look at the suspension, make sure there's no missing bolts, nothing about to fall off, which I've actually ran into quite a few times, and to see what we see underneath there, make sure everything's safe. We're still working on the safety, not the reliability just yet, so let's see what we find. So we'll start at the master cylinder. It's nice to see that's actually in black paint, so that means that's not really that old, hopefully. But it's all dry right here, but we're missing the brake switch. Uh, this will, once this gets, once this gets pressurized, the switch here, it'll send a signal out and tell the brakes to turn on. So he has no brake lights right now. So I would definitely consider that a safety issue. So we need to put a resistor on here and see when you step on the brakes, if it connects, if there's, cause this is going to just be a power in, hit the brakes, it connects, switches over and power out to the brake lights. So we need to see if that even works. If it doesn't, uh, we'll be needing to bleed his brakes. So here's our line. Just follow your lines around. It goes through the frame to a rubber hose right here. Rubber hose looks like it's in good shape. Everything's dry and it goes down the torque tube all the way and should split somewhere around here. There's our split. I'm dry on both sides of the split. And it's going to be a solid line all the way to the back of the slave cylinder. That's dry. Everything looks good. Not a safety issue, but this paint is just falling off. So it has rust underneath it. Then up there it's falling off. So I'll recommend to Jerry that we scrape some of this off and just throw a little rubberized coating up here. Um, scrape it off, sand it down, and just patch paint this back here so we don't have any rush issues in the future. Now we're going to follow our brake lines up to the front here. So you got to watch out for these brake lines actually rusting and just leaking somewhere where they're vibrating. So those look nice. I'd say, Jerry, you got a really nice car if you're watching. Okay, so this is actually here to help drain the oil out of here. So it looks like we actually have oil coming out of our drain plug. I would put that on a reliability issue. Then we have quite a bit of oil coming out right here. This is going to be easy. You can pull this plug out, uh, clean it really good, retape it, and bolt it back up. Oh, we're leaking oil. Transmission oil pretty bad too. So here's our transmission oil on the shift arms right here. 
and that's telling me that those seals are bad. There's no play in them, but um, now if you put the wrong oil in these, they'll leak all over the place. So that's also another consideration that has the wrong oil. So no matter what I'm going to do, I am going to pull the transmission out and rebuild it. Then our other brake line looks good as well. So this car really is pretty safe. We just need to work on this steering box. Okay, so I think that about does it safety-wise for uh, Jerry and Karen's car. Um, it's, we figured out what it's gonna take to stop and steer it. Stop, I think it's already there. Um, I'm just gonna put some new brake fluid in it because I'm gonna have the rear end out anyway, so it's gonna get just a nice refresh and flush. <clears throat> then when it comes to steering, found out that that gearbox is trash. Um, all the steering components are actually really nice and tight, but the box is pretty gone. Um, a lot of people are afraid to pull them out and rebuild them. Um, they think it's a lot more work than it actually is. So on one of my next episodes, you'll actually see me tear that down and show you how to rebuild a, a steering gearbox for our, an early Ford. Um, so it is the 42 to 1948, I believe, steering box is all the same. Um, 39 is pretty unique. And I think maybe 41 might be a little bit different. So don't quote me on that part of it. But that'll be a good learning experience. Um, all the suspension and everything is tight. It's bolted up good. So I'm not worried about that. Uh, don't want anything falling off. Then when it comes to dependability, now that one's actually a little bit easier, I believe. Um, when I test drove it, we found out a couple things dependability wise that are issues. One, we can't get any type of high RPM. Not good, can't get up to speeds, not being able to be fast enough on the road is also somewhat a safety issue. So uh, we need to figure out what's going on with that. I got two things that I'm gonna be looking at here. Um, distributor, then the carburetor, and fuel delivery. Now this doesn't have the mechanical fuel pump on it anymore. It is a flathead. It does now have an electric fuel pump back by the tank. It's not a bad thing, but it might not be set up right. Uh, if someone doesn't know that these need about four pounds of pressure at all times. Um, outside from that, um, too low, too high could cause issues, but it's not flooding. It's idling really, really well. So maybe it's a fuel starvation issue possibly. Um, we have a regulator up here and it was set on two. Now I'm gonna have to look up this regulator and see if this is the PSI, but if it's two PSI, that is not enough PSI for this carburetor. It needs about four, even five would be good. So I'm gonna set it that at five, and after I get the suspension back, <clears throat> and after I get the car back down, and I'll try to rev it up some, see if that clears it up any. But also, um, I recommended, since tune-ups are so cheap on these early Fords, hey Jerry, let's just do a tune-up, points, plugs, wires, all that good stuff, nice, fresh, ready, and new. Um, usually you can get that whole setup underneath 100 bucks, underneath 100 bucks, so just do it. The car is new to you, freshen it up. Then um, Jerry and I were talking that how he might want to hot rod this car later on the road. And by hot rod, we mean traditional hot rod. So that just means dual carb intake, some aluminum heads, um, some fitting headers and dual exhaust. Two dual exhausts at the back actually looks really, really nice on these body styles. So um, with that in mind, we both agreed that maybe we should hot rod the distributor instead of throwing points at it instead. Um, so we're going to replace that crab style distributor with the crab style e-fire. I really, really like the e-fire. It's really dependable. Then it's easier to adjust the timing than most distributors. So that's actually going to work out really, really well. And that'll get us set up for the future to have, you know, better spark for a better performing engine. Now also on dependability, we're not getting any charging at all from this car. As soon as I started up, the battery just starts going down, 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 down. And when I drove it down the block and back and it sat outside for a little while, I went to start it back up. Click, click, click. No battery at all. Uh, Jerry said the battery is brand new. It's still under warranty. So I'm going to trickle charge the battery. We're going to start it back up. I'm going to find out why that alternator that looks like a generator is not working. He said that's also brand new. Most likely it's not hooked up correctly. Um, also, when you put an alternator on a flathead, the flathead has to be grounded really really well otherwise it's not going to charge at all that's a common mistake when people throw alternators on flatheads um, a flathead originally had all of its wires going to the voltage regulator so it didn't need that housing to be grounded um, so that gets overlooked a lot also on dependability since 
we're going to be doing the distributor. I'm going to pull the whole front off. I'm going to take the radiator out and get to the distributor really nice, run all my wires really nice. That's what it takes to get to these on the early forward since the distributor is underneath the fan. Okay, This fan actually has a lot of play. And when it was idling outside, I noticed that it was rattling really bad. As soon as I noticed that, I shut it down completely and I haven't ran the car since then. <clears throat> Now on the Model A's, they had a really bad problem with throwing the fan through the hood, through the radiator, out the fender, tearing up stuff. And I haven't seen a flathead, um, I haven't personally seen a flathead fan explode and completely ruin the car like I've seen Model A ones. Um, so what I, I just want to be completely careful with this car because it is gorgeous. It's a gorgeous car. I don't want anything bad to happen to it. So it needs a new fan. That being said, these flatheads are really expensive and they're actually getting a lot more value lately. They're getting higher and higher and higher in value on a running flathead. Um, I should know, I'm a huge flathead freak. Flathead everything. I love flatheads. But that being said, we need to work with its deficiencies. Okay, One of its deficiencies as a design is that they get really hot. They have some, some heating problems. So what we're going to do is put a big electric fan on it. And um, we're going to run that 160 since it's the East Coast. We're not going to get a lot of cool weather. It's all really hot weather. We're going to get a 160 thermostat electric fan. And we're also going to get hit. I'm also going to make a shroud so it's not just a fan stuck in the radiator. A full shroud sucking the full surface of the radiator. An aluminum radiator. Aluminum radiator is going to make a huge difference. Huge, huge difference at cooling this uh, a lot better. And I might actually put waterless coolant in it, um, some Evans waterless coolant. It's a little bit more expensive, but it cools even better. Um, I'd probably say 15 degrees cooler than um, a normal 50-50. So that's just from experience, and that's not just written on paper. That's what I've seen um, personally. So I'm going to put that in there, and this flathead's going to run super cool. Um, hopefully it'll run at 185-ish. That's usually where they end up at here on the East Coast in Virginia. Um, I can't say what the temperature would be in other states with different temperatures, but with our humidity out here, I can usually keep it at 185. So that's a really good temperature to be at. And um, when we were underneath, I noticed a lot of oil leaks actually coming out of this car. Oil leaks are usually not that big of a deal, but this car is so pretty, uh, it de deserves better than an oil leak. Also, oil leaks can also be a dependability issue if you run out of oil somewhere on a long uh, trip going state to state on a car cruise since we're going to get this car back up to 65 miles an hour for sure um, He can cruise it on a big car cruise and go a couple states and sleep overnight at hotels and all that kind of fun stuff So we want to make sure there's no oil leaks because he doesn't run out of oil or have any issues um, with that so um, That oil leak looks like it's coming out of the drain plug and also looks like it might be coming out of the rear main I won't know that until I pull the transmission now. I'm going to pull the transmission no matter what the input shaft is really, really noisy, really, really noisy. So we need to get a new input shaft bearing um, so that doesn't go out on them at any point in time. And since we're doing all that, <clears throat> um, there's a little bit of tiny grinding when in and out of first on this car. Um, first should be unsynchronized. So the issue there is most likely wrong oil or if it has an adjustable pressure plate which this is not the right year for an adjustable pressure plate, but it could have been put on the car. So if it has an adjustable pressure plate, we need to get in there and adjust that so we can actually slow the transmission down more in neutral so we can actually get it in and out of first. Okay, so we're going to rebuild the transmission no matter what. That transmission is also leaking out of the shifter forks out of the top. So I'm guessing it has the wrong oil in it. Um, they didn't feel like they had a bunch of play in them. If they have a bunch of play, they'll leak. If they have no play in them, most likely the wrong oil. So um, small things actually is uh, small corrections, actually not really of a big deal. It's just a bunch of small things. So dependability, we're almost there. Little carburetor adjustment, distributor points, wires, all that kind of good stuff. So on future episodes, you're gonna see a lot of Jerry's car. We're gonna be doing Raptor paint on the floorboards underneath, nice texture paint. We're gonna be Installing Dakota digital gauges, rebuilding the transmission, uh, most likely a rear main on a Ford flathead. We're going to be replacing distributor. I'm going to show you how to wire up an electrical fan in your garage. Um, electrical fan is set up the same way on every single car, so that is pretty easy. But then we're going to do Dakota digital gauges. 
I'm going to show you how to wire those up. We're going to make sure we get an ignition circuit on those. I'm going to be installing a horn um, onto Jerry's car with 12 volts. I'm going to show you how to do the horn relay. I'm going to show you how to rebuild the steering gearbox, something that a lot of people are afraid of doing on early Fords, but it's actually really, really simple and not that expensive. Then I'm going to talk to Jerry and try to get a different muffler on this car. It is too quiet. Also, I'll be taking you to Trog 2021, and I'm going to show you what goes on behind the scenes, all the drag racing. I am supposed to get my car finished before then, and I have two months to put my car the rest of the way together, or together enough to actually drive it. So I'm going to be doing juice brake conversion on my Model A, my 1930 Model A. Um, I'm going to be rebuilding the brakes. I'm going to be doing all new wheel bearings all the way around. Um, I need to pull the engine out and finish welding some of my motor mounts, my transmission mounts. Um, they're all mocked up, tack welded in. I need to wire the flathead and get it running. It's not wired to anything. So I need to make sure I can start it. Um, I'm going to do a custom dash, a 1939 dash in my Model A. All original gauges. I have a 1939 transmission that I need to rebuild for it. Um, so you're going to be seeing a lot more, a lot more cars, a lot more variety, a lot of early Fords, a little bit of Mustangs. We have 55 Chevrolets. Um, we got early 70s Camaros. We have a lot going on in this series this year. So share my series, tell people about it. Thank you for watching. This episode is brought to you by Stromberg97.com. Visit Stromberg-97.com for genuine Stromberg 97 carburetor parts. They also have ignition parts to help hop up your flathead. Check them out today. Just driving by, someone put all these the old buildings down, put all the trees down. Apparently behind the old buildings is old Oldsmobile. If you look at the back, check out the back. The tree grew and smashed the bumper in. That's how long it's been here. The fender is all smashed in because the tree grew over it. But look at that trim on that bumper, dude. That is pretty. The trim around the tail lights. It'd be worth cutting those tail lights off, putting them on a different car. Like an early Bel Air would be cool. Put some Oldsmobile tail lights on it. But it's got a freaking Oldsmobile rocket. Probably locked up, but I mean, it looks cool. It's cool just to see a rocket just sitting here. Pretty valuable engine if it was worth anything, but the carburetor's off of it. You look down the intake, it's all rusted. So, I mean, it's guaranteed locked up, but somebody out there is looking for these valve covers, you know? Yeah. If you took these valve covers off and painted them, you went through uh, actually smoothing them out, I bet you could probably sell them for a hundred bucks. Pretty cool, man. I think might need some new rubbers on her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, but it's, look at this gravel. This is probably really hard to get out. Yeah. Well, this thing's been here for a while, dude. It's been on a little bit. Damn. I bet you if you pulled on it, it'd probably pull the car apart. That sucks. Even if the car was wasted, if you could pull it out, it'd be worth pulling out to, to sell some parts out of it. Yeah. Door handle? Yeah, maybe. You can't like the door handles, but the, the dash is actually in good shape. I guess the glass hasn't been broken out for too long. You can see the Oldsmobile symbol right in the middle. That's pretty cool on the dash. Then it's three on the tree. And that cluster is pretty cool looking. All, all those buttons on the left. I think it's pretty dope. Would love to see this car in its heyday. Yeah. And then that cluster. If this thing wasn't so buried, I'd probably offer them because they probably just want to redo the land, you know? They're kind yeah. of stuff. They're just like, I, man, I would offer to pull it out. Look at that. That's pretty neat. The trim's over here laying on the ground. I'll push it up. Pull out the side. Shit. Trim off the side of the car. Yeah. Pretty cool, man. Just back here in the woods, chilling. Whole barn's getting torn down, and 
the shop at one point. Firestone tires. <laughs> That's crazy.